Uh, thank you all for attending this opening of what proves to be a very exciting exhibition, but on the back of an even more exciting research project. Uh, my name is Marcus Banks. I'm the vice chair of the college, which means I'm kind of assisting the actual president or actual acting president of the college, who's hiding at the back. Um, but I, uh, I've been very flattered and very honored to open this exhibition because I've talked to Rajinda and Julie, of course, uh, about this project over the last year or so. So it's been great to to become involved myself in a tiny way. Um, it's very encouraging that the Arts and Humanities Research Council is funding this kind of research. Um, I mean, it's great that people study Shakespeare or whatever it is, uh, but the fact that they're working with contemporary artists, working on contemporary language use, um, really makes this special. And I'm, I'm very pleased that, if you like, the, the funding streams in this country are are not so sort of backward that they're not seeing the value in this, that I hope this kind of trend will, will continue. Um, focus on language, very interesting for me as a social anthropologist. Obviously, uh, I work in another language uh, as well as English, and um, I have an interest in, as it were, the interplay between language and the visual. Uh, but I'll just leave you with a, a quick joke. When I was a, a schoolboy aged about 14, uh, I went on a school exchange to Amsterdam and stayed with a host family who had a a son who was about the same age as me, and uh, we were very pleased to discover we were both learning French at school. We used to try out little French phrases with each other. And then one morning at breakfast, uh, where, where we'd had boiled eggs, uh, his mother said, "Would you, in English, for my benefit, uh, would you like another egg? And he said, no, enough is enough. <laughs> we thought it was hysterically funny at the time, but <laughs> I can see now why it's kind of a bit pathetic. Anyway, I've said quite enough, and I'm going to hand over to uh, my esteemed colleague, to actually tell you about the exhibition. Rajin. Thank you ever so much, Marcus, and thank you very much for uh, doing us the honour of opening the exhibition this evening at Wolfson. Welcome, everybody. How are we tonight? We well? Good. So I'm in the esteemed company of artists who we're going to meet in a short while. So I think I I'm almost feel like I should perform, but I won't because I really will let you down. But the artists are really going to kind of speak for themselves and, and do their thing. So welcome. Good evening. My name's Reginda Dudra. So I'm part of one of the research strands, which is part of the Creative Multilingualism uh, Project, the program of which this exhibition is a part. And our strand is strand four, which is Languages in the Creative Economy. So I'm working on that with my colleagues, uh, Professor Julie Curtis, who's here this evening. She's based here at Wolfson, and also Professor Philip Bullock, who's based at Wadham, who's one of the co-researchers. But unfortunately, Philip's hurt himself, and he sends his apologies, but he can't be here. So that's our strand, and we're part of this wider project, which is called Creative Multilingualism. Now, Creative Multilingualism is a four-year project funded by the AHRC as part of the Open World Research Initiative. So these were large, four times four large grants, which were given to a consortia of different universities uh, around the country. And we were really thrilled and pleased that the one being led by Oxford, and our PI is here this evening, Professor Catherine Cole from Jesus College, uh, is leading that. And we have a team um, who are exploring languages, not just in terms of their everyday functional aspects. So languages absolutely are important in terms of transactional context. Languages help us to do business better. Languages help us order cups of coffee. Languages help us to talk to each other. But actually, we were very interested in the creative aspects of languages. So not just modern languages, but also international languages as well. And hopefully you'll see uh, from the range of languages that we've got uh, on display as part of the exhibition. These are also non-Western languages, but also languages which have been translated and played around with as well. And this is where we have the idea of our exhibition, which is called Slanguages. Now, if we wanted to, as part of Languages in the Creative Economy, we could have quite simply looked at different creative artists and what kind of different art languages they're working with, Spanish, Russian, Punjabi, Urdu, and so forth. But we actually thought, no, I think there's more at stake here. There's more at play here, literally, but also in the sense of languages are important for identity, languages are important for culture, and languages are also important in terms of propping up and developing the creative economy and creative industries. So one of the things we wanted to do with this exhibition is not just put on show, if you like, the different languages and how languages can be used, whether in their creole form, patois form, pidgin form, as well as the, the everyday usage. But we also wanted to draw attention to that there is a the, the actual languages at play in terms of their form and content 
with the various artists, but also then there's a language of play in terms of genre. And the three genres that we've got uh, featuring tonight are grime, uh, we've got urban sign languages and comedy, as well as uh, percussion, jazz percussion, West African and pidgin as well. So do have a look at the, the panels and please do read them if you haven't. There are some also some QR codes, which if those of you who are new media savvy, you can click on and find more multimedia information as well. And the first, uh, not, I'm not going to be shameless about this, we really want you to interact as well. The hashtag is Slanguages, so please do text, tweet, Instagram. I know a lot of you old Oxford professors are always on your Instagram and your Twitter, so please do get on that and do text and tweet. For the old modernists, for the old modernists who like pen and paper, we have a comments book, so please, of course, leave your, leave your um, comments and feedback for us in the comments book as well. This is the first iteration of the exhibition. This is a touring exhibition, so it's one of the outputs, one of the many outputs that we are working on and developing together uh, as part of, of the program and not least our strand. So next year we'll be taking this exhibition and we'll be developing it and taking it to uh, the Parkside Gallery at Birmingham City University where I'm based and we'll be developing it that with our colleagues and John and Chris are here tonight from Parkside Gallery so we're really glad that they've come and I know some of you have really travelled far and wide beyond Oxford as well. So thank you for doing that and thank you for coming. So we'll, be, we'll definitely be touring this to Birmingham and then we'll have two other venues, possibly possibly London and Reading, who are our project partners, but that, that's to be confirmed as well. So the exhibition will be touring and it will also morph and develop as well. You'll also see we've got some kind of vinyl lettering around the room as well. So we're deliberately playing with this idea of languages being creative, languages being playful, and also sometimes it is very hard to pin down languages or to think about words and what the actual meaning of the words is. So this is where the idea of slanguages come in again. It is about community languages. It is about uh, identity. It is about kind of ins insider, outsider, who belongs, who doesn't belong. But it's also this notion of languages being truncated and being played with in the various creative forms. So that's a bit about uh, the research that we've been collectively been doing. And this exhibition is one way of representing that this evening. Now, as you know, exhibitions aren't, I'm sure those of you who've put exhibitions together or have been involved in any kind of creative output, exhibitions are not the sole preserve of the lone artist as much as I would have thought that they were, oh, I'm going to put on an exhibition. Absolutely not. I have a number of people to thank and just bear with me for the last couple of minutes, please, before I hand over, because I think these people really deserve their thanks and acknowledgement uh, this evening because they've been fantastic in collaboratively putting together not only the exhibition in terms of how it looks, but also thinking, design, ideas, uh, and, and, and those. So the people I really must thank, so I've, I've just got a brief list, are the three artists, first of all. Without the three artists, their wonderful work, their exciting work that they're doing, and their cutting edge that they're working, this exhibition would not have been possible. I'm going to introduce and hand over to Simon Redgrave, who will give them their proper due and introduction. But our artists are Article, aka Joshua Holness, who works in Grime, there's Lekan Babalola, who works, uh, who's a Grammy Award winner and who works with uh, Pidgin, Jazz Percussion, West African Languages. And then there's Rinku Barparga, who works with Urban Sign Languages, as well as uh, Deaf Comedy. I really want to thank Simon Redgrave, who's my exhibition co-curator, and the Punch Records team, and alongside him, Nick Drew, who's our exhibition designer. So here's Simon, I'm going to introduce in a short while. The Punch team are around, and Nick, who's at the back there, Nick could just say hello. Thank you, thank you. Thank you very much. Now, these guys have been fantastic because in terms of the intellectual design, but also putting things together, they've been second to none. So in the highs and lows, and we've had lots of highs and very few lows, they have been second to none. And they've really kept me, they've kept me on the straight and narrow in a really good way. So thank you very much to them. I couldn't have worked with a, a better team. I'd also like to thank uh, the Faculty of Art, Design and Media at Birmingham City University, where I'm based, and there we do, like here you guys at Oxford, conventional research, but of course ours is better, but I, we, we won't go there. But also we do practice-based and creative research as well. So exhibitions, artwork, jewellery, we're also engaged in, in that work too. And I'm really glad and uh, really thankful to our Pro Vice Chancellor and Executive Dean of Faculty who's here right at the back, who's just arrived uh, just a few minutes ago, David Roberts, who's been supporting not just uh, the development of my work at BCU, but certainly the development of this work and who, who serves really well on our advisory board so thank you very much for there so if any of you are in Birmingham come and see us come and see our nice new shiny campus and the fantastic research we do better than Oxford at Birmingham City University 
But I am also affiliated to Wolfson College. I'm an ele elected visiting scholar here. The college have been uh, very kind to bestow me that honour. So it was only right that the exhibition we thought would kick off uh, at Wolfson College. And really, I want to thank a number of people here at, at Wolfson. Uh, Julie Curtis, who's been my co-researcher, but she's been fantastic in terms of sharing ideas and bouncing things around and also finding my, my way around the college. But also Louise Gordon. Where is Louise? Louise, is she here? Oh, she's, there you go. So, Louise Gordon, who's been in the events office, has been amazing. She's really always behind the scene. And again, literally, here's, there's a physical manifestation. She's really helped out in terms of what's been possible, but also input with good ideas as well. So we're really thankful to her. I also want to thank, finally, the team of Creative Multilingualism. We have a fantastic PI, Principal Investigator, and that is Professor Catherine Cole, who really also helps and steers us. And occasionally, we also say, right, Catherine, let's stop and go for coffee breaks now. So that's always fantastic. So thank you, Catherine, your, your wonderful PI. B. Bellew, who's our Program Manager, and Katie, Katie Terry, who's our Web and Social Manager, uh, who can't be here this evening because she's got family commitments. So we really want to thank her. So I'd now like to hand over to Simon Redgrave, who's the exhibition co-creator, but also head of creative development at Punch Records. Thank you. Right, good evening. You all need to come forward. Don't make me come over there. Don't make me come down there. That's better. There we go. Now, if you're here for Pilates, I'm sorry. <laughs> Hopefully this will be better. Um, all I can really do is echo what Rajinda said. I would like to particularly thank Nick Drew, Nick Drew Design, a long-time associate, excellent design work here, uh, the Punch team, and also Alan McLean of Deaf Explorer, uh, who is all about the creative case. This would not have been possible without you, Alan. Thank you. Now... The exhibition, as Rajinda has said, will expand as it goes forward. We will add more artists, we will add more stories. Each artist has a couple of themes, a couple of stories attached to them. Um, I'll leave you to find out for yourselves or to have the artists uh, explain that. We've got Article, we've got Lekan, we've got Rinku, and over there we have Tanisha Deans, who is not stuck on the wall yet, who is a real person moving around, but will be the next person to be featured as we go to, uh, go to Birmingham. Right, without further ado, let me introduce this young man who I've known for 15 years. 15 years. Yeah, yeah. And I've seen this guy come from being a youth star to being a, a Birmingham scene star to being an international star and particularly uh, connecting in uh, Jamaica. Uh, exploring his own roots. Actually, before we get on to that, I'm just going to say, that's so typical of me, before we get on to that, I was going to say, with what Virginia says, it's always good to work with real live artists because they're difficult. Many years ago, I used to work in Birmingham Museum and Art Gallery, and that was easy because all the artists were dead. You could say whatever you wanted about them. You could write whatever you wanted about them. You could put their picture there or there or there, and, and there was no comeback. But working with real live artists who are at the top of their game, who have got things to say, who are confrontational, who do disagree with each other, who do disagree with you, is important. Because it can change you, and it can happen in real time. So, so what I would say is I would urge people to um, keep being different, yeah? Keep being different, keep having your own opinions, yeah? This whole thing is about how language changes language, yeah? And I'm enjoying being a part of that, always am. RT, do you want the mic or do you want the talk? <laughs> I like the Coke. Hello people, Wagwan, Bless, Bonjour, Ola, Nangadef, uh, Jambo, does anybody else know any more greetings? Ciao. Ciao. Eh? Say again. Ciao. Yeah, any more? Yes. 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 Privet. Yasu, any more? Hola. Hola, yeah. Bless up, people. My name is Article, as Simon said. 
Um, very happy to be here today. This has been a really interesting project and an interesting process to be a part of. Um, my space and my area of expertise, I'd say when I say expertise, because language has been everything to me in my life from um, like as young as I can think, language, music, sound, that energy has been the platform which I've been able to express myself and also the platform which I've received information, stories, morals, all sorts of different things. So when I got drafted into this project, so I was very, very excited. The, um, the concept that we went with, with the piece that we got over there was word, sound and power, with the concept being the word, everything to me in my life, from um, like as young as I can think, language, music, sound, that energy has been the platform which I've been able to express myself and also the platform which I've received information, stories, morals, all sorts of different things. So when I got drafted into this project, so I was very, very excited. The, um, the concept that we went with, with the piece that we got over there was word, sound and power, with the concept being the word has a sound and the sound has a power. Now, we already explored in the room how many different ways we just was able to say hello, so we know that there's so many different languages and cultural identities in this place. Um, coming from Birmingham, a little area called Quinton, which was talking about earlier, right next to Barley Green. Big up yourself. <laughs> yes, man. It's a massive, massive mountain part of like different cultures, different peoples, different styles of living. So I was just saying, like, it's crazy. The school that I went to, like, it was, it was never abnormal to, in morning assembly, you say, Salam Alaikum, and then you walk out onto the playground, and then you tell your friend, Wagwan, and then there's so many different styles and ways of communicating. So this piece here is really just based on that, really. Um, the influence of word, sound, and power, where it comes into things, is that it doesn't really matter, for me personally, what the actual language is, because the sound has an intention. Like, you could... You could throw sounds at, like, if you, even, even if you've got, like, a pet dog, you get me? You can talk to your dog. People can communicate with a dog, and it's the sound, it's the intention, it's what you're giving over that actually has the power behind it. And that's translated through the music also, through the drum, which Lekan explores in his piece over there. Like, these are real foundation things for us. Um, I wasn't going to do anything today. I wasn't going to do a piece today, but can I do a quick piece? Is that all right? Yeah, really, really quick, just to show what I did. I said I'm a, um, I wouldn't describe myself as just a grime artist. I think all genres come together just like with the languages. So this is just a quick piece that I had. You got time? Yes. yes. Can I spare a moment of your time? Yes. Watch me timing every syllable or rhyme I tell. Timeless tells of this fine timeline. Time flies, so I'm flying. It's turbulent, so you must take time. You can't break time. People must think I've got the way they're asking me to make time. Time's money, so I budget. There's a lot of time wasted, so be careful where you put it. Even when you're walking, time's still running, time's burning. Get with the time because the time's coming. Look, time is a myth to me. This time is a gift to me. I utilize my time because this time is a gift to me. Time, space, I don't need a shift to be. My time, space, is a, my mind is a time, space continuum that's shifting me and moving me through space and time. Pitch my mind frame here up in the space of time. I'm trying to paint a picture here up in this frame of time. Because we all share the same time at the same time. Yeah, we all want to blame time when it's blame time. I've been through the worst time, like I've served time and my only crime is that I couldn't take time. Thank you for your time, people. Thank you for that. Thank you for that. Thanks for taking the time. <laughs> yeah. Right, now I'm a father. I have uh, two children and a dog. And as a father, you must never say that you have a favorite child. However, in this exhibition, I do have a favorite child, and that is the orange panel behind that gentleman there with his fingers to his nose. Urban Sign Language. We've got this on the door at Punch, and everybody comments on it. So, uh, which thanks to Alan, like this. we're having a meeting with a gentleman, and he was explaining how um, in what he called ordinary sign language, by which I think he meant white people sign language, driving was like this. But when he was out with his friends, driving was like this. We had to get that in. Can I introduce you to Rinku Barpaga?
Hi everybody. Hi. So my name is Rinku, uh, and this guy here is my interpreter or my slave. His name is Cam. He's doing the voiceover. Uh, so it's great. It's great to be here, and I'm going to just talk to you about myself. Actually, how I sort of got involved into this project and talking about languages. Um, when I was at school, sign language was was banned. It wasn't something we were allowed to use. We were educated in spoken English, and I didn't use sign language until I was eight years old. And I met two young black deaf uh, people from Jamaica. Uh, this is back home in Birmingham, which is where I grew up. I'd never seen that type of sign language that they were using, and I sort of learnt it from them and became uh, skilled in using it. From the age of eight up until today, that's the sign language that I've used. There is a difference between British sign language and urban sign language. And actually, when I was younger, I uh, got a, tele a job working for ITV as a translator. So what I did was I translated from written English into British Sign Language. Um, that was actually my first job. <laughs> I, used to, I used to work as a cleaner. That's what I used to actually do before that job. So I was working away. I was, I'd work sort of cleaning four or five different spaces in a, in a day. And then somebody saw me signing and said, you know, I really like your variety of sign language. So they put me into an audition, and in the audition I was using this variety of sign language, and they were saying, that sign language looks brilliant. It looks brilliant, but it's, it's not clear. It needs to be polished. And I was thinking, what do you mean my language needs to be polished? Well, your grammar, the way you use verbs, that sort of thing. So I went down to Durham University, and at Durham I was trained to use proper British Sign Language. And I didn't know what that meant. I wasn't actually sure what that was. I thought my language was fine. We use a sign in British Sign Language called, or oh, for shame. And somebody said to me, what's the urban sign language? And that's it. And they said, no, you can't sign that. That's not how you do it. But that was the language that I learned as I grew up. And they asked me where I got it from. And I learned it in Birmingham. And they said, well, that's not the correct language you're going to destroy the traditional use of British Sign Language. And I couldn't understand that. Couldn't understand that idea. Anyway, eventually, when I went back home, I realised that everybody was using the variety of language that I used. And I realised that we had to record and document this urban sign language. And we took it back to Durham. And they said, you know, that was... There's a question there. Why did we ever develop our own language vernacular? So we've spent the last 13 years researching that. British Sign Language didn't want to accept urban sign language as a variety of language. Luckily, I went and worked at MTV. And when I was at MTV, they would give me scripts that used American slang, hip hop, that kind of language. And I realized that formal British Sign Language was just could never express that. It didn't have the equivalents, but urban sign language did. So I started using it on screen. And you can see, I don't know if you can see on that poster over there, but there's a picture of me doing some, some varieties of urban sign language and the differences between that and British sign language. So here's an example. In British sign language, uh, one of the signs that we use for drunk is what I've just shown you there, drunk. But in urban sign language, it's that. Or it might be, someone says, are you talking about me behind my back in British sign language? That soul sign means that whole sentence in urban sign language. <laughs> One of the funniest things that has ever happened to me was you go to an event, you, you know, whether it's a social event or a formal event, and you would meet somebody, maybe a girl, and you're talking to this girl, and all of my black and white friends are walking behind us and doing this. And you'd be thinking, what does that mean? It's an urban sign language. There's no way to translate that into English. People would always ask me, what does that sign mean? And I'd say, I don't, I can't, uh, nothing, nothing, nothing. And I realised that we have our own code. Urban Sign Language has its own code that can't be translated. The interesting thing about the urban vernacular that we use is, I would say that it was probably established perhaps 30 or 30, 40 years ago. It still has links to British Sign Language. We've picked things from American Sign Language, and every country has its own formalised sign language. In Britain, of course, we have different regions. Liverpool, Manchester, London, they all have their own varieties of sign language as well. So you can see that urban sign language didn't just come about 
for no reason. The reason that it actually came about was that back in the 70s and 80s, ethnic minority communities who were deaf weren't integrating with white deaf people. So deaf clubs were excluding us. Um, it wasn't until 1995 that I was allowed into a white person's deaf club. Um, so that was how we started creating our own language. Of course, colonialism took over and white deaf people told us that we couldn't use that variety of language because it wasn't correct. I'm sure you've seen in America, you, you I can't remember the name of um, some of those people, like sort of gangsters who have their own code and they communicate with each other in order to avoid people understanding what they're saying. And that's what we do. That's what we did it for originally. That's what we still do. Urban sign language isn't in the mainstream at the moment. But interestingly, even though British Sign Language, uh, the British Sign Language Police said you're never allowed to use this variety of language, we, and that we have to use traditional sign language in the mainstream, we are working hard at the moment to break through those barriers. And it's actually, beca it's actually because of social media that urban sign language has become much more widespread. People are beginning to ask questions about why they don't understand the vernacular that we use. So we continue to fight. We continue to get deaf people to use urban sign language. Maybe I should teach you a few little signs. I don't know whether that would be interesting, some basics. All right, so let me try and remember some of the things I use. So when I'm talking to you, some of you, obviously, it's funny because I can see it's quite a diverse crowd here. So when I'm seeing my friends, I'm kind of throwing it all out, but because it's quite a diverse crowd, I've, I'm feeling like I can't quite get my flow out, as it were. But I have noted some things down for you. So this is the sign for boring in, in British Sign Language. That's a nationally recognised sign. Every deaf person recognises that. Urban Sign Language is that. Relax. That's British Sign Language. Relax. Our sign is that. <laughs> walk. We say walk. Shock. That's British Sign Language. That's what we use in Urban Sign Language. So, facial expressions are extremely important in urban sign languages. And when you're talking, let's say, about a girl, that's what we sign in urban sign language, and we actually use the hips as a recognition of the, sh of the person we're talking about. There's many more examples of urban sign language that we could use. I'm just thinking if there's anything else I want to say. No, I think that's it for now. So thank you. Thank you for your time, and thank you for inviting to be part of the project. Thank you. I learnt it in Birmingham. That could be the, uh, a new subtitle to the, uh, to the exhibition. I learnt it in Birmingham. Now, a new performer, Tanisha Deans, who has her first exhibition at the moment at the Gap Gallery in Birmingham, um, which has got paintings, drawings, uh, and uh, QR codes, like the ones on the wall, linking to her performances on YouTube. Now, if you look, each of the artists we featured has two themes. So for RT, it's, it's, it's call and response and word, sound and power. Um, one of the themes we have is, is, is pigeon. We'll get to that in a minute. Something that Tanisha does, not in all of her spoken word, but in some of it, is to use patois, which gives it a bit of extra power. So anyway, that's enough for me. Tanisha Deans. So, yeah, as Simon said, I'm Tanisha Deans, and my exhibition is now open for you guys to view at The Gap in Birmingham on Mosley Road. It's open till the 4th of November, so if you want to check that out, you can. Um, I'm going to perform a poem for you guys um, now. It's in Patwa, and I came here when I was eight, so this is just a bit about the poem. I came here from Jamaica when I was eight, 
And um, I used to, I remember always like calling my mom back home saying I wanted to come back home. So like I used to cry on the phone and say, Mummy, me want go back and all that. So um, the poem's called Me want go back. It's, just, it's my experience of, you know, calling my mom and wanting to go back home. So yeah, this is Me want go back. Fear drenched excitement. The thought alone was thrilling. A plane flying, a new country. The eagerness was too much to bear. I was here, foreign at last. But my world turned to scraps when realization licked me in my head top. Mo wan go back, mo wan go back. Naivety of a child, minds changing like British weather. Sun kiss bliss under a coconut tree. Yeah, that's me. Happiness kicks in and fear drowns out. The different garments, bright lights, all the flavors I can put to my mouth. Pat a dry up light drought, I sold out. Yeah, my sell out. My nago back. My nago back. Swear I think my make up my mind. But every so often reminded by these tear stained phone calls. Caved in fist dented walls, concrete jungle buildings standing way too tall for my liking. This is not home. Me no live ya so, pack your bags on, swim no, just go. You might make it. Conversations in my mind clouding me blind. Mo wan go back, mo wan go back. Me tired of cold breeze, wan walk around in no sleeves. My lung for push me to another sun and. I just can't. Making money is too hard. And look who quite no go far. Them swear think you rich cause you come from abroad. But anyway you go, you can't salt. Their minds built in these perceptions, these illiterate misconceptions, they flee, but face deceptions. I only have one direction. Mummy, mo wan come back. But me can me can go back on my yard yet. Thank you guys. Thanks, Tanisha. Well, all these youngers, we should hear perhaps from somebody with a bit more gravitas, a bit of a, perhaps an elder statesman. Is there anybody in this room who's got a Grammy? <laughs> Is there anybody in this room who's won two Grammys? Is there anyone in this room who's the first person in Nigeria to win a Grammy? I believe there is. That person is Lekan Babalola. Lekan, would you please replace me? Um, please, let's do what I do. Let me, I don't know what to say first. Let's just play music. OK, can we clap together? Okay. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Stop. Okay. We go. That's four, right? That's in four. One, two, three, four. Right? One, two, three, four. Let's count it in five, and let me show you how we can do that because we're going to need it, and that is <laughs> one, two, three, four, five. One, two. Some, we're going to put five over four, okay? It's not magic. Some people from that line to that side, can we count four? One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One. And that side, we count it in five, which is louder, please. One, two, three. No, slower. So it's one, two, three, four. One, two. And this side, we do. We start again. I, look, I'm a musician. There's nothing I want to tell you that you don't know. I want to play music with you. Here, we play one, two, three, four, one, two. And here, we play five on top of them. All right. 
And then uh, I want to greet you. If I say, are you day? You will answer me, respond, I day. Yeah? Are you day? Are you day? Okay, we're going to put that on the music, call and the response, which is here we count. Are you day? Are day? 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 Answer me now. If I ask you, are you day? You will answer, I day. And you remember the five that we play, which is, you remember? And here, you play what? Okay, can you play four for me here? Are you day? 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 We need to do it properly before I speak. Uh, I, I'm a musician, okay? I'm not a talker. Here, it will be five. And that's what you're playing, which is, are you day? 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 Are you? Are you? Are you? Are you there? And thank you. <laughs> My name is uh, Lekon Babalola. I'm from Lagos, Nigeria. I'm sure a lot of people know Nigeria here, West Africa. And um, we are naughty in some ways, and we're good in some ways. I'm sure you've heard of Nigeria in many, many news. OK, I was born in Lagos. Lagos Island Maternity Hospital. And Lagos is uh, the multicultural part of where all languages is there. But the language they speak in the, in the south that is very popular, it is Yoruba because it's close to the coast. And in the Middle Belt, that's when this pigeon stop. But in the southeast of Nigeria, we have the Igbo and the Yoruba that is mixed with Igbo. But there's a place called Wari, which is near Sapele. Um, I'm sure you've heard of the Bini Kingdom, one of our kingdoms. Nigeria has many kingdoms. In the north, we have the Sephar dynasty for the Hausa people. And in the southwest, where I come from, is the Yoruba region. And in the east, southeast, is the Wari, we have a very tragic uh, war in 1967, which is Biafra. And the Biafra people are the people that popularize Pidgin English. So the subject I've chosen for this language is the Pidgin English. And Pidgin English is spoken in Nigeria for business, uh, commerce, family, friendship. But before, of course, we were under the European uh, colonization. You are not supposed to speak pidgin English when I was in school. When I was in boarding school, it's forbidden. Especially if you're in boarding school that is Church of England. That one is particular. In Gregory's College, or another kind of Catholic school, you can get away with it in dormitory. Then it came in the 67, we have a very, very big war, whereby the people who speak pidgin English want to break away from Nigeria. Nigeria is made up by the English. It's a project. It's like you're putting the Korea together, the Chinese and the Japanese to form a country. It's not going to work. So the only language that works for the Yoruba people that speak the Yoruba, which is my people, and the Igbo people, and the Aousa people in the north, which are the Arabs' influence, is speaking English. And now come this uh, musician in the uh, 70s. His name was Fela Nikola Kokuti. Fela happened to be a distant cousin of mine. He went to the States, and he, he, Fela was trained in England at the Trinity College of Music. So he studied the classics, English classics. English is the order of the day in my house, in Fela's house, Professor Wallace Shinka, distant cousin. 
So for us to actually speak Yoruba, our own language, it is a crime. You know, you're growing up. So everything I grew up around is English. But in school, in primary school, in uh, secondary school, in boarding school, or when you come to the street, you mix with the street people and they teach you in pidgin English. So what I've just done with you, how you day is how you ask somebody, how are you? And then you answer, I day. I day means I am fine. So it comes to the time whereby Fela came from the States. While he was in the States, he come across the Black Panther movement through Sandra, he was in LA in the 67, 68, 69. And that time, we've just finished our war. Our war was from 1967 to 1970. And Fela did a track called One Nigeria, Viva Nigeria. Viva Nigeria, he used the English language, which actually can effect, take effect among the people in the north and people in the south too. But really, where Fela would be driving to in order to popularize the Union of Nigerian Youth and the Nigeria project that is now getting destroyed is to use pidgin English. So in 1969, Fela came up with the pidgin English, which actually broke into the heart of Nigerian community and is used by ordinary laymen. It's like the way the Jamaican use Patwa. It's like the way the East London Cockney people broke their English down. So myself, I am a musician who's been using the talking drum, which is the way we Yoruba people use the language of the drum to communicate. I've traveled to Cuba for five times to study the transatlantic movement of Yoruba people that went to Cuba. And when I got to Matanzas in Cuba, they told me in 1872, that was the first place they played Bata. So, Language for us in Nigeria is not just words. And that word is what we call in Yoruba language of washe, which means so be it. So in different form, in different opinion, Pidgin English has been the key to open the door for the street people to meet with the people in the office, in the government area, in everything. But before, it became a struggle. And as you understand, if you study the history of my country, we were under military regime for a very, very long time. A majority of the people in the army, some of them didn't study classic to speak properly, how are you and everything. Some are ordinary street people that went to the army. So when the military regime was there, the Pidgin English begin to be accepted in government places, in the churches, and is mixed with a lot of things today. So here we have Fela, who promotes Pidgin English to break it down, to be used by common people. And today, in the Nigerian popular culture, popular music, popular theater, Pidgin English is now being accepted. So, but for me, I think it's very, very important that, especially what is happening now, when I came to this country in 1980, it was difficult to, I'll tell you, it was very, very difficult in the sense that some section will tell you that you have an accent. And some section will tell you that, where are you from? So you have an accent and you, where are you from? It's two different things. But those who are actually asking, you have an accent. They don't even want to communicate with you at all, at all. So I thank Simon and Professor uh, Rajinda to actually invite me to be part of this uh, exhibition because it's like a, free way, a freedom of movement and freedom of artistic creation. Thank you very much and enjoy. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Lekan Babalola. I'd like to invite uh, Professor, yeah? <laughs> yes, indeed. Thank you. Thank you very much, Simon. You can see why I invited Simon to be Master of Ceremony. Thank you all very much for your time. Pardon me? 
Absolutely, I'm better looking, but that's, that's contentious. Okay, thank you very much all for your time. And please, now, there, there are drinks. Please do uh, have some drinks, have some snacks. Do read the exhibition. The hashtag is Slanguages. Do let your friends and colleagues and networks know that the, this exhibition is on here in the buttery until 12th of December. Just check with the lodge before coming in terms of opening times. And do stay in touch with the project as well, Creative Multilingualism. And please leave your uh, comments in the feedback book as well. Thank you ever so much. Do enjoy the evening. Thank you.